mute the site. Okay, and we should be live and ready to go. And uh, so yeah, welcome to Waters Up. This is a podcast brought to you by the Maine Water Utilities and the Maine Water Environment Association, where water and wastewater professionals can earn training credit hours just by listening to this podcast. You are listening to episode eight of this wildly popular series, a follow-up to episode seven, Waters Up Beyond the Clean Water Act. We'll dive a little deeper into our discussions from uh, earlier episodes, and we'll talk about the impact of the Clean Water Act on our great state of Maine, and we'll hear some great stories from our returning guests. I am your host, the self-indulgent, completely inexperienced, wannabe, legend in my own mind, Rob Ponto. So thanks so much for joining us, and as always, if you made it this far, please don't leave now. So if you're watching this episode, you're most likely watching live on YouTube or through a Maine Water Utilities website. Um, YouTube is currently the only platform that hosts this podcast because it's free and easy. Um, but if you're here, please go back, check out some of our earlier episodes. Um, and even if you want to go back and check on episode seven, if you haven't heard that one, you can go after the show and uh, still listen and still get credits for up to 90 days. So we'll talk more about credits in just a minute. And of course, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this episode because without sponsors, we don't have an episode. Um, we need that money to offset the lost revenue for providing free training credit hours. Um, and a hundred percent of the proceeds goes back to the main water utilities. Um, and the host makes nothing. The guests make nothing. Everyone here is strictly volunteering their time. So thank you so much for that. Um, the organizations both appreciate it. And of course, as, as, I, as I said before, our sponsors are what make this possible. So um, Carlson Systems and uh, EJ Prescott are our sponsors for this episode. And let me see if I can just do a quick screen share. And, you know, I am still my, uh, my own IT person, so I apologize for how slow the show is sometimes. But um, anyway, uh, Anyone in the industry knows the value that EJ Prescott provides. I don't really have to say much other than to thank them again. Uh, they're a main old company that grew into a reputable national company. And uh, as EJP continues to grow and expand, they pledge to continue providing the industry's finest water, wastewater, and stormwater products, all by backed by their exceptional level of service. And then we also have with us for today, uh, Carlson Systems. And uh, the Carlson Systems is excited to support this episode of the Waters Up podcast. Carlson Systems distributes water and wastewater equipment throughout New England. For 11 years, they've represented leading manufacturers such as Sulzer, Grunfos, GA Industries, and USEMCO. And lastly, I need to tell everyone how to retrieve the credits. So immediately after the show or soon after the show, either through the main water utilities website, if you click on the link for podcast, or if you, um, oh, am I in, did I end the screen share? Sorry. Okay. So if you, uh, anyway, as I was saying, um, to retrieve the credits, there'll be a quiz link after the show posted in the comment section or on the MWA website. You click that link. It's a little three or four question quiz just to help us ensure that you've seen the show. You fill that out, you pass the quiz, um, and then uh, you'll be able to get your credit hours that way. And just so everyone knows, I'll tell you right early, um, some of the questions are pretty obvious, but only if you're listening to the show. So make sure you pay attention and I will point it out as we move along. Um, so with that, and I do have a correction from our seventh, our episode seven, we talked about the 50th anniversary celebration of the Clean Water Act down at, we noted that it was at Payson Park and that's actually Samard Payne Park in uh, Lewiston, not Payson Park, which I believe is in Portland, but, uh, but we did have the park, section correct. So it was indeed held at a park. Um, so with that, let's move on to our introduction of guests. 
Hey, Alan, how you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. How's yourself? Is everybody there? Yeah. Hello? Hello. Hi, Rob. Hold on a second. We can hear you and each what other. What happened? I don't know. We're hearing you. Are you guys there? Yes. Yes. And we can hear and okay, see Okay, something's fine. going on. I apologize. Um <laughs> We, we can hear you, Rob. Okay, for some reason, my uh, I have to mute the tab for for the um, for the YouTube broadcast, and I lost the the Zoom sound, and it's telling me that everybody on this site is muted. So, um, let me see. You guys back now? Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties here. I might have to uh, start back, uh, back out and come back. How, how about now? We're uh, all here. Okay, good. All right. I lost it. I'm, I apologize. So just to give everyone a quick explanation when I, when I, so I can review the, uh, the live broadcast on the YouTube and see the chat, I have to have an open window on my computer. And when I muted that site, because I get the echo and the feedback, there's about a 15 second delay. It muted everything and, uh, and I couldn't hear anyone, but so how did I do getting through the credits in the first sponsorship message? Did that go? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Fine. Um, and, uh, but I've also lost, is everyone, um, I can't see anybody else. I can only see um, my sponsor message. So are you guys there? You have your cameras on? Yeah, we're all here. Yeah, that's can... so, so odd. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll just continue this way and I'll pretend that I can see you, um, even though I can't. Um, but we've got it going. So We'll make it work. That's the nature of live TV and live live broadcast. So, Alan, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing pretty good. I got through the 20 below and with the wind chill factors and everything still alive and all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so, you know, we talked a little bit on the first episode. You are a furniture maker and a teacher. Um, where are you teaching? Uh, right now I'm over at Skowhegan High School, but I, I, I don't teach all that much anymore. Uh, I run do adult ed, which is an evening thing, a few nights a week, uh, more to get out and see people, I guess, and, uh, uh, than, than anything else. Uh, but it's right down my area, you know, to economics and social studies. I mean, I've taught that for 25 years over in Waterville. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice evening. I only have a few kids, pretty, pretty nice chore. Okay. Well, um, well, I appreciate you doing that. And obviously, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And we, we asked you to come on because for one, you stole the crowd at the 50th anniversary celebration last fall. And uh, I thought you'd make a great addition to our audience uh, or to our um, guests for the podcast because uh, you were the first whitewater guide on the Kennebec River, correct? Or in Maine in general. Actually, yeah, we used to have, when I started guiding, there was no guides license for whitewater rafting. You simply had a guides license for really everything. Um, but that that very quickly changed uh, in the early 1980s. The state decided it had to take a hand in regulating uh, uh, safety issues in the water and uh, also to try and combat the development of of, of um, monopolies on the river. And so they they changed that around in the um, I actually had a hand in writing the new guides license and they, they did a whole different system, whole different system today. You get guides licenses today to either be hunting guides, fishing guides, recreational guides, or whitewater guides. So, so, so let me, uh, is that in the name of safety or is that in the name of drive of revenue? Why we got to have all these licenses? Oh, I mean, it's, the story is really about both. I mean, a lot of it originally was that 
Um, uh, the, the state wanted to ensure that the people that were running boats had some knowledge about the river, other than none. And, but on the other hand, uh, the outfitters from their concern was uh, the biggest driving factor in the fears of uh, whitewater rafting outfitters in the early days was that companies from Pennsylvania and West Virginia would show up here. And they saw that as one method that they could limit who exactly got a license. Um, and so there was, there was uh, for them that, and also there was an issue of liability. You know, if you can go to a court after a drowning or somebody gets injured and say, well, we are licensed main guides, that has a lot more uh, import than saying, well, yeah, I, I just been doing rafts for my summer job. So yeah, some, that definitely makes sense. Like how often, speaking of that, I mean, how often, not that it's related to clean water, but how often are there deaths on the rivers in Maine? It's not that common, actually. It, there was a great deal of fear at the beginning that that would be yeah. so. And it was justified because nobody knew what they were doing. I mean, it takes years really to develop a good strategy and to know exactly how you're going to run this. Uh, but after, um, after the first few years, um, there wasn't as much concern about it. Uh, I was on the main the safety committee for whitewater rafting for, oh, eight or 10 years. And we used to examine the statistics every year. And one of the statistics I always developed to try and make sure that we didn't have any um, uh, behind the back charges against us for safety was comparing it to skiing. And whitewater rafting was always four or five times more safe, I can't remember now the exact specifics, than, than skiing was. And so it never really became a large issue. And I don't think, even though there have been some, what I would consider egregious fatalities in the river, I don't think there's ever been a significant court case about it. Uh, okay. And Speaking of which, let's put in a plug for the Maine, what, Maine Water Environment Association, New Hampshire Ski Day, which is going to be St. Patty's Day, March 17th at Loon Mountain in New Hampshire this year. That's right. And as we just heard, that's uh, five times more dangerous than rafting on, the, on a river in Maine. <laughs> so. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Alan. I'm going to come back to you for, I got some other uh, questions for you, but let's go ahead and introduce the rest of our guests. And just so everybody in the audience knows, I still can't see anybody on Zoom. It's kind of hilarious, but I do have the, the YouTube window open so I can see my reactions and everyone's reactions and faces about 15 seconds after it happens. Um, so this is, this is going to make for an interesting show, but we'll, we'll plug through it and see what we can do. Um, so, Nick, you there? I'm here. All right. Well, Nick is a staff scientist and Healthy Waters Project Director for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Uh, we abbreviate that as NRCM. He's a Yale University and Yale School, School of Forestry graduate, uh, a Bates Award winner. And uh, tell me a little bit, Nick, you're, you're an uh, avid duck hunter, but you, you said you've been transitioning more to upland hunting in recent years? Um, <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say so much that I've been tr transitioning more to it. I, I do it. So I guess that means, you know, whenever I'm upland hunting, I'm not duck hunting. So okay. Maybe I, so you still <laughs> get out on the rivers duck hunting as much as you can? As much as I can. Yeah, the last couple of years have not been great um, in terms of getting out uh, during second season. I, I haven't um, gotten out during second season as much as I used to. And I, I've had boat problems and problems with my dogs. And um, so, you know, I, I really would like to get back to uh, spending more time out, you know, doing coastal duck hunting in the, in the later part of the season, but um, we'll see. But yeah, I, I also really like upland hunting and it's it's a lot easier. It's a very lightweight sport compared to like having to trail a boat somewhere and haul a so, bunch of decoys and get up super early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I agree on the getting up early in the morning thing. That gets harder and harder as time goes by. It really does. So when, <laughs> when you're upland hunting, what are you hunting for? Are you looking for the rough grouse or partridges we see here? Woodcock, yeah. Um, 
So, and when you do that, you're more in forested areas. You're not really on the rivers. I mean, I, I have found that I, I have pretty good luck with grouse at the small stream crossings and culverts and stuff like that, but generally not around the water. Is that correct? Um, well, you're probably right for grouse, but um, man, woodcock love riparian areas. So okay. if you want to hunt woodcock, being around uh the side of a river it's a pretty good place to be okay that's good to know i don't do a lot of woodcock hunting but i i'm not opposed to it um i did eat one one time it wasn't my favorite but you know it's it's not bad it's kind of weird it's like a bird that's a red meat so i thought that was interesting yeah um, like that it, too. yeah yeah so hey you also told us on the last episode that when you were a teenager you were eating bluefish three times a day. Is that correct? That is correct. And that, so one, I think you were trying to illustrate how good the fishing was at the time, but two, like, how, like, did you prepare it differently for breakfast than you did for dinner? Yeah. So I would typically, I mean, this was a typical day in, in my teenage years in the summer, I would uh, go to work. I would have leftover bluefish from the night before in a sandwich while I was at work. After work, I'd hop in the whaler, go out and catch a bluefish or two, make them for dinner. And then, you know, every, once a week or once every two weeks, I'd run a big batch of bluefish through a homemade smoker. And that's what I have for breakfast on toast or a bagel. So I was literally eating it three times a day, which is, you know, not necessarily the best in the world for from a perspective of mercury or pcb exposure but man that fish is good to eat lots of people don't love bluefish but i love it yeah i i've had it uh a couple times and you know it was okay but i, I don't think i share that same passion where i would eat it three times a day <laughs> um, but it is great that you were living off the land i mean you're you're like a, a native um, right down to the, right down to the core, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we also have with us, thank you for that, Nick. I'm going to come sure. back and, and get some more of your stories, but we also have with us uh, Mac Richardson, who is the former superintendent of the Lewiston Auburn Water Pollution Control Association. He's a founding member of NEBRA. Uh, he currently works some side jobs, I think, for some from school districts and taking care of their wastewater treatment systems. And uh, you're not a Mainer, Mac? Well, not originally. You know, I, I'm sort of a fake Mainer, I guess, or an almost Mainer. I don't know. I've only been here 40-some many... years. 40 some years. So, well, I mean, I've only been here 43 years. So, um, but that's, that's one of those things. We're funny people up here in Maine. It's like, if you're not born here, can you ever really be a Mainer? Um, not. No. I, I would say, yeah, I think you're an honorary Mainer. To me, you are, especially with the work that you've done, you know, for helping our environment and our rivers. And, and that's why you're on this show. So to me, you, you make the cut. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So tell me a little bit though, uh, we were talking beforehand. Uh, give me, give me this story about this AWWA fly-in a few okay, years well, back. Where yeah, the uh, the I'll try to be quick on it. But years and years ago, people remember they built a big old uh, snowman up in Bethel and named it Angus King of the Mountain. Shortly after, it was reported that uh, he had told some reporters he didn't mind being named it being named for him it was better than having a sewage treatment plant named after him. So I wrote him a letter and said, gee, dear governor, there are a bunch of people at work at these facilities that might take offense at that. He wrote back and said, you know, I didn't mean any offense and so forth, which was fine. I took it well. Um, but uh, then he was the uh, the speaker at the, the WEF AWWA or the NUIA portion of the WEF AWWA fly-in and got up there and told people, you know, I don't know that much about wastewater treatment per se, but I remember one time this yo-yo sent me this, this letter and uh, people around the table, I wasn't there at the time, but people around the table went, you suppose that was Mac? <laughs> Which it was. But uh, the end of the story is that then a couple years later, I was down there because I was the, the uh, 
main director for Nuia, and of course the, the state directors go down to the fly-in and you meet your representatives and your senators and went into the office and I held out my hand and I said, uh, uh, Senator King, I just wanted to tell you, I was that yo-yo that sent you that letter. And he smiled. We both had a good laugh over it. Uh, it, was, it was a good time. But, uh, you know, it points out that, um, you know, we just don't get the respect we deserve for for the jobs we do. And, and what's really um, a bit disappointing about that is sometimes people think that they forget where this where this problem originates you know right um, put another way everybody poops you know that's that is true and i think actually i think i have a shirt somewhere that says that um but i will tell you mac you did get your point across because angus I, th I think a lot of people know he lives in brunswick and you know whether you agree with him politically or not um, he seems like he's a pretty good guy and, and he, he comes and brings his motor home in a couple times a year and uses our dump station. And he's always very appreciative and, and very nice and, and, uh, great to talk to. And obviously he's on vacation when he's in his RV. So, um, you know, you, you try not to bother him, but I think he, I think you got the message across. I think he has a lot of respect for, for what we're doing. So I appreciate that in the time you took to send that letter. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, let's jump into it. I do want to touch a little bit more on this episode. I, I like the personal stories. Uh, we covered a, a lot of technical information actually on the, in the last episode, which was fantastic. But um, I'd like to go around and just have everyone tell us, you know, uh, about your best day on the water in Maine, because we are here celebrating the work that that these water and wastewater professionals have done. Um, we're in a very water rich state where it's a very fortunate situation. Um, so tell me about it. Let's let's go to uh, Alan. We'll we'll start back at the top. What's what's your best day or your best memory on on a main water body? Well, you you asked me. You mentioned you're going to ask that question. I thought long about it, and I I guess I can think of a lot of days, but probably the one of the better ones was happened in 1976, right when we first started rafting. We used to run traps. Uh, our raft trips on the Kennebec started in those days up on Moosehead Lake. And went all the way down the East Outlet, three miles, then eight miles out across Indian Pond. Then we went into Kennebec Gorge. So we had to start quite early in the morning. We started, we'd start, we had to have the boat in the water by 7 a.m. And we'd get there early and we'd set up and wait for the customers to show up. One morning, um, there weren't many customers. It was in uh, early August. And they, those that came, there was eight or 10 of them, they were all in the same family. And they had decided they were going to give a trip down the river to their grandfather, Eddie Comber, who turned 84 that day. Eddie had been oh, wow. a long log driver. He had, uh, he had owned pulp that he'd taken down the river, and he'd worked on that drive all his life. But, of course, he hadn't. It had been 30, 40 years before he'd last been on the river. And it was a perfect day, you know, one of those days where the, the mist is coming off the water and getting blown aside and that warms up. We get out onto Indian Lake, the loons were everywhere. And all the way down, that old duffer told me nothing but stories. And he, you know, he was a good storyteller. And so he'd go on and on. It's where I learned the names of those places, for example. I mean, when I started in 1976, nobody had been on that river for uh, other than the, the pulp drivers uh, picking, the, picking the sides of the river, but nobody had really worked that river for several decades and everybody had forgotten the names. And, and uh, I mean, they only ever met anything to the people that worked on that river anyways, but he knew them all and knew, explained everything. And, you know, he always wanted to know about the boat and he'd done pretty well over the years, he's fairly, fairly wealthy. And so, uh, you know, he could afford to be, he could afford to be calm and cool about everything. And his kids really, we're enjoying them, you know. The day went by just so beautifully, so smoothly. One at one point, he says, "Oh, he says he looks up north. Oh, he says they used to call that Three Pine Landing." He says, "If you go up that path, you'll find an old logging camp, and you'll find some lean-tos, birch bark roofs that we used to live in." I kind of thought, I mean, you know, it's an old guy's dreams. I don't know for sure if he could remember exactly where these things were. But anyways, the, the trip went on and he told me all these names and had a wonderful day with him. Got down to the Forks where he lived and he invited the whole crew over as well as all of his families. And we sat around uh, drinking rye whiskey until watching the sunset over the Western mountains and drove back that night. And 
I mean, it was just a, a wonderful day. I learned a lot. I had a good time. It didn't even feel like I was working anymore. Everything was just just so beautiful. But you know, the amazing thing about that is that um, about a year later or so, you know, Eddie had died. And, uh, a, 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 I felt kind of bad that I didn't see him more. But you know, when you're 26 years old, old people are just from like aliens. They're from another universe or something. You never think about them much. And uh, about a year later, I was coming down the river and I was by myself in a rowing frame and I'm picking up gear, bringing gear out at the end of the year. And I went by that place. He said, well, there's a broken path you can follow. And I said, by God, I'm going to stop and see if the, if the guy knew what he was talking about. So I, I had eat out, carried out and there was a path and you could see where they'd broken stone steps for people to walk up to it. And you got to the top and, and I could found a cellar hole where this camp had been. And then off to the left, I could just see something standing. I go over there and I'm damned if it wasn't still a, a lean to. And it did have birch bark roof that had all those years had never leaked. I got inside and I'm looking it all over and you can see on the side where the men had drawn all these pictures of women with pendulous breasts and you know the pictures that you the graffiti that you see in everyday life. I'm looking at oh, all yeah. the and right down the bottom, written over and over in pencil with it, Eddie Comer, 1937. It was just an, a, an amazing way to end a trip with a with the old guy. I'd say that yeah. was probably one of my better days on the Kennebec River. So that's kind of funny to me that you, you just gave us this nice story about a like a relaxing, beautiful day with an old duffer, your words, um, out on the river. I mean, you led countless raft trips down the river, like through rapids and, and like you've seen wild things happen. And your favorite day was was a nice, like somewhat relaxing day. Is that true to say? Yeah, that's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, I never thought about it quite in those terms. But if you know, if you would ask me what my worst day is, it's almost always because of water conditions. The good days, yeah. not so much. Maybe because you just get used to it. You know, at the end of it, I tried to count up the number of days I went, and I really couldn't be very accurate. But when I left the river in '88, I think it was, uh, I figured I'd done somewhere just just over 950 runs. And when you do that that many times, I don't want to say it becomes the same, but you get used to it. You don't yep. get used to people like Eddie Comber. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that sounds like a special day and a great memory. I mean, you know, we're, we're 50 years later and, and it still sticks in your mind. So clearly it had an impact. So, and you know, it wouldn't have happened without the river, right? Without the dams and. and it it uh, wouldn't have happened. And, you know, uh, also uh, his whole life, was cert was was based on that river even after he started he was a bateau man for a lot of his lifetime but even after he left the river he he you know he was in the logging business and he he logged uh uh he would buy land and and log it off resell it and a lot of his wood went down that river uh there wasn't anybody that lived in those in those they call them the upland the, the uh, up river communities uh Caraton, yeah. West Forks. You wouldn't find anybody there in those days whose li livelihood wasn't made off that river in some way. Yeah. Um, well, and and honestly, it, it's still a lot that way. I mean, there's there's some other things going on in those areas and hunting and stuff, but it's all it all revolves around the river. So, I mean, yeah. that's how we ended up with Lewiston and Auburn, right? I mean, yeah. um, so well, and you know what? On my list right here, it did say, "Tell me about your worst day." Is the, is the next thing, but. We, we'll try to keep it positive today. So um, if we run out of time or we need to fill some time, we'll come back to that. But um, hey, Nick, you uh, you got a tough act to follow. You think uh, you think you can give us some insight about your best day on on the river or on a main water body? Well, I think I told one of my best days the story of one of my best days on the last show. So okay, um, uh, which was when I saw the billions of juvenile alewives migrating yes. out of the out of, yeah, the, bumping out of the waters. <clears throat> so I'll tell you a different story. Um, I've had really two, had a lot of fun duck hunting down um, on the main coast uh, out of Brunswick. And um, you know, I've done that a whole bunch of times, not in the last couple of years. 
but um, I've had two incredible days, you know, that were just unbelievable. And one of the things that you learn about duck hunting is that you've really got to put your time in to have one incredible day. <laughs> and there are most days you're lucky if it's a good day for bird watching, you know, you get to see stuff, but so I'll tell you about one of, one of these days. And the reason it, it was such an incredible day, a lot of times um, it seems like the best duck hunting days are in really bad weather and pretty sketchy. Um, and I can tell you about my worst day if we run out of time, um, cause it was sketchy. Um, and I'm glad I'm here talking to you. Um, but uh, this was not one of those days. This was a great day. It was a little bit of a hairy drive down to Brunswick where I met up with a friend of mine. Um, we got out really early, but it was like sleeting, snowing and raining periodically throughout the day. And one of the things that's really true is that when it's sleeting or raining, the ducks don't see well. And they're not so picky about decoys. They see decoys and they think it's ducks. So I've never had you know, hundreds of ducks in our decoys that day. It was incredible. And there's something that I've only seen a few times in my life. I, I call it the duck swarm. And people don't really realize, again, it's kind of like the fish. Um, the juvenile alewives and the, the adult alewife migrations. Duck migrations are these enormous natural phenomena. You know, millions of birds flying up and down the coast and across the country and um, almost nobody ever notices it. You know, you see a duck every once in a while in the water, it's like, oh, there's a duck, there's a mallard. But when they're packed together um, in places like McCoy Bay or Middle Bay, um, which they are in the late fall, early winter, um, you get the chance to see thousands of them at one time. And, you know, like one of the best ways to end up getting ducks is if a clamor goes by in an airboat, that'll put up all the ducks, um, you know, a mile around. And you just, the cloud, it, it becomes like a black cloud of ducks. It's more like you would imagine like bees coming out of a beehive. And you just can't really comprehend how it is that this freezing cold landscape is so productive that it can feed all of these animals. You know, it's just amazing. So anyway, I, I was out on this one day with my friend and, and both of our dogs and we shot seven ducks between the two of us and his dog would not retrieve a single one. It would not go into water because it was so cold. So my dog, my dog got all the ducks. And some of those retrieves were like 75 yards, 100 yard retrieves. And that was my first duck dog. His, his name was Percy. And he was an incredible dog, just an amazing dog. Like not just because he was a good waterfowl dog, but because he was like a really good citizen. You know, he was a great dog in the house. He was really nice to people. Um, he was just awesome. And uh, I think, you know, I just felt like such a connection to, to the water and to the dog and to the birds that day. You know, I just will never forget that day. That was incredible. Well, well, thanks for sharing that with us. I mean, it is, I've had some experiences, not, not specifically with ducks, but you know, you're out in the woods and it's serene and nature and it, and you just see the beauty of these animals. And um, I, so I can relate it's uh, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it sounds like all your great days out on the um, out on the rivers and, and water bodies seem to revolve around that connection with nature and getting to see the the different animals and, and fisheries and birds and so forth. So, um, does that sound that sounds fair, doesn't it? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Mac, that leaves. I mean, you know, you never have any problem telling us a great story. 
Um, and I know you got one about swimming in the Androscoggin River, which we haven't covered yet. But is 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 that the one you're going to share with us today, or you got well, something different? Me. I guess I would say I can't give you my best day on the river because I've been out on um, at least a dozen, maybe two dozen rivers, you know, from the Nizinskit, the Little Ossipee, the Ossipee, the Bear River, Sunday River, you know, the Androscoggin, you name it. But a great day out on the river is when I take somebody out on a river and they go, wow, I didn't realize how cool this is, particularly when you go down the, the Androscoggin. I went went there with a lady I'm with right now. And, you know, she's lived right there in South Lewiston for years and years. And I said, hey, let's do a little trip down, you know, just down Dresser's Rips, down um, a little ways down to the, to the Durham boat launch. And it's not a particularly great section of the river, but it is fabulous. And you get out on these rivers, and you see no one. Typically, I get out on the river and I pull off and have a little picnic on the way. And it's like I owned the place. It was like I was in the wilderness. So, man, any day out on the river, particularly when I take somebody new out that hasn't been out, is uh, is great. Um, but I will tell you, my worst day on the river was on the Swift River when I made a mistake trying to slip line through a couple cataracts you know, little short waterfalls, five, six foot waterfalls through uh, granite slabbed, uh, you know, waterfalls. And I thought, well, that's too tough for me to do. So I'll slip line my kayak through it. Well, the problem was, as it went over the waterfall, the, the water, you know, hit the front of the kayak and launched it like a missile. Well, I was holding on to the line. And I had it wrapped around my hand instead of having it so that the line could, you know, in a, in a necessary, I could let go of it real easily. And so it pulled me off my feet head first into a, into a basin that was, was literally granite sides all around. I could have split my head open like a cantaloupe. Um, I was just damn lucky. I, I, I made it and didn't, didn't get hurt. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're all lucky because it's not we, you wouldn't be on this show if that had, if that had happened, Max. So I appreciate you making it through that. <laughs> so um, if you're slip lining, remember be, hold the rope so you can let go of it if you need to. That's the lesson yeah. I learned there. I can see Alan there is laughing at me, and I deserve it. <laughs> well, he's probably got some stories about ropes and and rafting, right? Anyway, I would say Alan. There's, a, there's yeah. nothing like a, uh, uh, canoe problems or raft problems to put a lot of line in the river and to create a lot of other issues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So no, while you guys were sharing, a, a couple of things came to my mind real quick is just, you know, I, I did a, I was down in WEF Tech in New Orleans probably four or five years ago, whatever rotation it is there. And, of course, you're, it's right on the the Mississippi River, right? And so my wife and I were decided we'll go take a, a boat cruise on the Natchez, I think it is. It's a it's a river boat there. And we're like, oh, we'll do that. It'll be fun. We'll see the beauty of the river. And I'll tell you what, it is not what I expected. I mean, when you're from Maine and you grew up in the in the rivers and on the coastal communities and you see the beauty and then you get on that thing and you're going up the Mississippi, there was an old sugar factory that was run down. Uh, maybe some swamps, the river's brown, uh, barely no fish or life in it at all. It, it was just not, you know, the food was okay and it was entertaining, but compared to what we have up in here, we're, we're just absolutely spoiled um, with our ecosystem. And, uh, and then there's another story I can tell you about ropes and, and water skiing and stuff, but that's, that was my worst day on the river, but show is not about me. So we'll, uh, We'll move on. Actually, I got to do a quick sponsor break because as usual, time is flying by. Uh, but I do need to thank Team EJP. And I'm going to try. I lost the video when I did the screen share last time. So I'm going to try it from scratch here and uh, and see if we can do it uh, again. But actually, we'll start with Carlson Systems, you know, a fantastic company that I've been working with for years. Um, 
And again, they're very excited to support this podcast. Brian Olson, who's a principal at Carlson Systems and vice president of sales. He's a huge supporter of our mission and he's always willing to step up. He never hesitates when I ask him about sponsorship opportunities. You know, they distribute water and wastewater equipment throughout New England. For 11 years, they've represented leading manufacturers such as Salzer, Grunfos, GA Industries, and USEMCO. Their recent purchase of David F. Sullivan and Associates has expanded their product line into Evoqua, West Tech, Duperon, BDP Industries, and more. Uh, Carlson Systems, happy to support the Waters Up podcast, and I, and I can't thank them enough. And then also need to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Team, team EJ Prescott, um, you know, I've been working with them for over 20 years, and I can't think of a single time where I've had an interaction with them where I didn't come away smiling. They just, they have a fantastic crew that provides an exceptional level of service. And personally, I've dealt with most of their staff at one time or another, whether it's Robbie, Keith, Joe, Jason, Robbie, Dan, Steve, Mike, Reggie, uh, even Peter himself. You know, that's just to name a few. Their, their associates are all top notch. And uh, they're extremely creative. So if, if you're ever looking for a solution to a problem, no matter how unconventional it is, uh, give, give Team EJP a call and, th and they'll figure out a way to help. And, you know, and if they can't, they'll get you to someone that, that can. So uh, let's try this stop share and see. Nope. Screen did not come back, so I still can't see the guest, but I am watching on the YouTube video 15 seconds behind and things are going well. Um, so on the last episode, we did talk a little bit about the toilet paper over under, and we stumped Alan on that question actually, but he caught on real quick. Um, but I do want to go ahead. What was that again? The toilet paper over under? Yeah, the toilet paper over under. Oh yeah, I remember now. I remember now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I never heard anybody discuss that one. I've thought a couple of times about it. Have you have you had any insights since we last discussed it? <laughs> whatsoever. None whatsoever. I figured after the podcast, every bathroom you went into, you'd check and see how the toilet paper roll was. But may, you, maybe you will now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rob, I know this is your thing. I have to tell you that I, I may have mentioned my mother was really big. That it had to be over. And she said because women – when they when they go to take the the toilet paper, if it's under, then they can get their nail polish on the on the you know on the on the wall, and so it's got to yeah. be open so they don't put their nail polish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, that's what I actually had this discussion with my kids the other day, and they all said over because it's well, it's easier to grab, and you you can't have it the other way. But I think there is something though. If you own, someone told me once, if you have cats. You want it under because they'll roll and roll it back up instead of unrolling it, you know? So I don't know, but I don't have cats. So, and we know Nick's a dog person, so he doesn't have cats. Um, so anyway, you can't hunt with cats, right? Does anybody have a hunting cat? Hunting cat? Yeah. That's fun for them. I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, they are good for rodent control and pest control and stuff, but you can't really, like, take them in your truck and have them go track down some birds for you. So um, so let's talk a little bit, though, about the paper industry and the impact that it had on our rivers. And I think, Alan, you, you talked earlier, when you first started rafting, there were still logs in the river. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 had, uh, uh, they had enjoined all the river drives years before but they'd given the company times to get their wood in. And in 19, the summer, 75 was the last year they could cut for the river, but they had 1976 to put all the wood in the river and get it down. <coughs> and that's the year we started rafting. So we had to learn to raft with the, with the wood. Okay. And so that was actually uh, four, I think four years after the Clean Water Act had already passed. Yes, Clean so, Water Act. It had been, it had been several years. Uh, and actually, I did, they were not pulling the wood because of the Clean Water Act. They were pulling it because of um, act, uh, a movement started by a guy by the name of Howard Trotsky, uh, who in 72 had uh, been hired by the state to do a, a biological analysis of why there weren't any more cold water game species growing in the, in the Kennebec. 
Uh, and that summer he spent working as a graduate student there, changed his mind about what the Kennebec was. And what he saw was the problem was navigation of logs. So he started a lawsuit that actually was quite successful and was picked up by Maine's attorney general who turned it into a federal lawsuit. But that was done under violation of the Navigation Act, a 19th century Maine law. Um, and as a matter of fact, Trotsky's lawsuit to get the pulp out of the river, actually all the pulp, all the pulp in all the rivers in Maine, was um, started out as a lawsuit to try and insist that they provide a passageway for traffic coming down the river, because by law they're supposed to. He knew very well that no one would do that. And Scott, of course, it, financially it was impossible to do. It would have made a system of boom logs and gates that could not be managed. And so in any event, that ruling that the pulp was a navigation hazard is what drove them all off the river at the time. It okay. wasn't that clean water because the issue became for them very quickly the gelatinous mass that's created by pulp bark slopping off. Matter of fact, a lot of that ended up in your end of the state because the, the pulp would hold onto it for 30, 40 miles and then get it beat off somewhere down river where, so it was everybody's problem up and down the river. Well, yeah, so, and that's a big point. I'm sorry. That, Matt, sorry yeah, no, Mac. on the last episode, we, we did touch on that a little bit, how the Clean Water Act was like the first, all the prior legislation was related to navigation of the rivers. Absolutely. Water. Historically, it's been navigation and commerce. And, and, you know, the other thing I would mention about the log drives is, you know, we still are dealing with some of the legacy of that. If you look at, at the Androscoggin River and, we can have a little debate about how we should regulate a river that has a big lake in the middle of it, but Gulf Island Pond is still not meeting DO quality in, in the depths. You know, a good portion of that, at least from my understanding, is due to the bark that fell off of the logs and is still slowly degrading and chewing up oxygen in the rivers, particularly in those deep pockets. You could still so go... On Indian Pond, for example, is very shallow up at its northern end where the river came in. And you can still today look down and cannot see the bottom because it's piles of logs. I'd be willing to bet if you went to that pond and looked at the bottom, you'd find the same thing. It's, you literally cannot see the bottom of the pond because there's four or five feet of piled sunken wood and bark on top of it. It's it, They're awful messes. So... Um, and Nick, maybe you can chime in on this a little bit. So is that something that we still need to address or will that will that eventually erode? I, I've heard stories about uh, actually, and, and you, you maybe you know, Alan, like there's people that actually die for these old logs that have been preserved for hundreds of years and then they make furniture out of them. Um, but but is that something that we need to address? Like, should we should we be removing these logs from the river? Do you have a, you have a thought on that, Nick? No. They, they tried to do that originally. They, I mean, okay. they were, at one time there was giant barges moving up and down Indian Pond uh, that would have clamshell diggers on the end of it that would pull up logs and then dry them off and sell them as pulp. But they weren't mandated. They tried to do that as a for financial gain. And I and I've read about you know sort of boutique outfits where they'll send divers down to get you know uh, trees and then they do make furniture or or sculptures or whatever out of the wood and it's quite valuable because of the you know they've been sitting on the water for a hundred years the problem in maine though is that we we don't have a lot we don't have a big hardwood tradition you know maine right. uh, all of our woods have always been softwoods and so uh i th i would suspect there'd be a lot more people would do that if it was hardwood pulp down there but most of it is softwood and it, it, that, that really means a lot when you're, make, when you're making furniture or things from it. I mean, that changes the texture of it, the color, the shines, everything. And uh, so it's not as popular to do that as it was. But there are several people. There's a guy up in, um, uh, in Millinocket that makes his, I, I assume, makes his living from doing exactly that, selling wood made from sawed up a pulp. Right. Yeah, it, it is. It is a valuable resource. And I'll just mention, you don't have to go up to Indian Pond to see it. You can go out on the presumpskit here and see lots yeah. of logs underneath. I suspect it's that way up and down the rivers. Yeah. yeah. So what about from, you mentioned the, Mac, you mentioned the dissolved oxygen levels. 
um, and then the logs, but it, does that, do those logs provide a habitat for fish? I mean, is, is it really that detrimental and, and I, are they what's causing the low dissolved oxygen levels? Well, you'll, you'll get me in trouble here because, you know, I'm going to get out of my expertise here pretty, pretty quickly. Well, we got but, Nick on the line would, too. He, I would just say that, you know, it is a mixed bag. Um, it provides hiding places for juvenile fish. Um, certainly, you know, if you look at along some of the smaller rivers, they've done some chop and drop to try to make some cooling areas so that some of the even cold water species have a place to, to rest when it gets hot during the, the day. So it's definitely a mixed bag, absolutely. Nick, you're a pretty avid fisherman. You wanna weigh in on that a little bit? I think it really depends. It depends on, um, for, for small cool streams that have brook trout in them, you absolutely have to have that, well, the, the jargon is coarse woody debris. And brook trout need that um, both to hide when they're little um, from predators, and also they use it to hide, to ambush their prey. Um, and uh, if you pull all the logs out of streams like that and straighten the streams out, which of course has happened in a lot of main streams, you lose the brook trout in them. You know, it's a different issue when you've got thousands of logs at the bottom of, uh, you know, naturally slow moving um, part of the river uh, where, you know, they're just sitting and rotting. Um, and that that's probably not a place where you're gonna have um, the same kind of cold water fish ecosystem anyway. So, you know, whatever organic matter you have at the bottom of something, somebody's gonna live on it. Um, you know, so it's, it's habitat for somebody. It might only be bacteria, but. No, well, a that's good, a fair. Excellent summary, Nick, really. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that makes sense, you know, is uh, I do some brook trout fishing, not a lot, but you, you don't catch the brook trout out in the bright sunny areas where the stream crosses the power line. It's, it's in the woods where there's a bend or a turn or some rocks and, you know, some kind of um, something to break up the flow and something to hide under basically. So of course that's where your lines always get entangled too, which is what makes it such a pain in the butt. Um, so let's talk a little bit, uh, kind of switching gears is somewhat Clean Water Act related, but I wanted to get everyone's opinion on, on this CMP corridor issue, um, which is probably laid to rest at this point. But I know I was actually up in the Forks a couple of years ago for a rafting trip and they had already started uh, widening some of the streams. And uh, I mean, some of the, the power lines, I apologize there. And, but I wanna talk about the impact on the streams and then, but then there's also this need for, for power, not necessarily for Maine, but as we're, we're switching to more electric, you know, heat pumps and, and electric vehicles and stuff, our demand on the grid is getting higher so, or, or greater. So what's the, what's the solution here? And um, Nick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to start in on this one. Can you give, uh, give your opinion or maybe the NRCM's opinion on the corridor and kind of touch on what some alternatives might be? Yeah, so maybe you know this, but we've been a very um, active opponent to the CMP corridor. Um, this issue yeah. isn't is not laid to rest, um, and there's still a number of legal proceedings that are going on. So it's the fate of the corridor remains unclear. But I'll I'll tell you quickly why we oppose it, um, which is because. Uh, there are no benefits to the climate from this project. This is just shifting existing generation from Hydro-Quebec from places like the Midwest, which pay them a spot market price for electricity to Massachusetts, which is willing to pay a contract rate price. So it's more money um, for Hydro-Quebec and CMP and its parent company, Avangrid, get to take a cut of that um, because if their project goes forward, the electricity would throw, flow through Maine to Massachusetts. Um, okay. I'll give you an example. One of the lies that 
that CMP and Hydro-Quebec have used on this is that they spill 10 terawatt hours, which means like 10 gajillion um, hours of, of electricity every year. Um, and if there was this power line, then they wouldn't waste that electricity and wouldn't have to spill it. Well, that's baloney. All hydropower projects spill. And they spill at times when you don't need the power, namely right. in the spring and fall. Right. And so, yeah. so you know, Paris Station and Dam, they're, they've, they're doing the same thing on the down right. times. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the, the thing of it is, and, and, and so we've always argued that, you know, at times when the demand is greatest, Hydro Quebec is not going to have any, any power to spare. And this weekend, past weekend, was a perfect example of it. They imported 2,000 megawatts of electricity from New England. They've been telling us all along that they never have to do that. They were just lying. So, well, well, thank you for actually. I mean, that, some of that info I wasn't aware of. You know, because I I hear the rhetoric in both directions, and and it, this isn't a you know I'm not going to get debating on this show in, in a political thing, but I, I think you make some great points there, Nick. Um, Alan, from uh, you spend some time up there in, in the mouth of the Kennebec and, and in that area, and uh, you know I know some camp owners up there that aren't happy, but what's do you, does your thoughts or like how does the uh, river rafting industry see this project? It, there's a split in the river rafting industry on this between the owners and the and the and the guides, and the, a lot of the owners were, I guess, bought off as kind of a harsh term to use, but they received financial remuneration for going along with certain aspects of it. I don't think you'd say they received it, but the industry received it, uh, and also most of them have had to live for years um, getting along with big companies like CMP uh, and at one time Great Northern Paper Companies. On the other hand, the guides serve, the guides tend to be younger. They're not as invested in that. Um, and they don't like seeing change and having to deal with, for example, a power line, whether it's gonna go above that river or below it as CMP at one point offered to do, um, doesn't make any difference to them. So I think that that part of the industry is really split on it. I mean, I looked at it, at the issue, I, I really can't, I can see good arguments on both sides to tell you the truth. What really depressed me is that the public discussion very quickly focused upon things that were absolutely immaterial to the issue, really. And both sides had the boogeyman that they were throwing up there that really meant nothing. They played upon a, a Maine's dislike for Massachusetts people. I mean, that was really <laughs> evident through all that, uh, the promoting of they made all this big talk about clear cuts. Well, the reality is that they were they, the clear cut that they were planning on making was approximately, and I worked it out just before we came on the air, 965 acres. That's all they're going to clear cut. And that all of a sudden became a big topic. In the state of Maine from 1986 to 96, we cut 2 million acres a year. Uh, uh, and yet, and we, and we ponder about something like, anyways, point being, I would like to have heard a discussion like what we just heard of things that uh, uh, that matter instead of the public. Well, I'll, yeah. just, I'll just which ended up quick. being about what I thought in consequence. I'll yeah, weigh in quickly to say that I agree that there are parts on both sides, and not much substantive debate came out. And I'm not I'm not um, faulting you know NRCM in saying that, but a lot of the issues that that were paid more attention to were not the, the more important ones, I think. One thing that we got to do if we're going to do renewable energy is we've really got to look at storing that energy. And that's one of the things Nick brought up. You know, yeah, they do waste energy. If we had more storage available, you know, one way of storing energy is to pump water up like they do at Northfield Mountain in, in Western Massachusetts. That's not a bad way to store it. Well, I mean, it, that is one way to store energy. So and, the problem... But, so that there are a number of issues. The, the thing about it is that all hydropower projects spill and they spill for two, two reasons. One is because if you build enough generation capacity to take advantage of the highest flows in the river, you're basically building this huge capacity 
that you can use 2% of the year. Right. Nobody's going to do that. It doesn't make economic sense. So you build a generating capacity that um, works somewhere around what the median flow is in the river. And that's why hydropower projects spill. It has nothing to do with transmission. Transmission line, more transmission is not going to help you with that issue. And so the idea that, what's that? I've never heard that argument myself before. I've never heard anybody make that, that argument. That, that was the fundamental point. argument from Hydro-Quebec, yeah. is that yeah. they don't have enough transmission to get all the electricity out, so they have to spill water. And quite frankly, that's just an outright lie. Because, so, okay. because they've done what every other hydropower producer does in the world. They build to a median flow. They're not transmission limited. They're generation limited. Generation capacity limited. And it's not an accident. Sorry, Rob, you brought this up. It's <laughs> not an accident that Hydro Quebec never gave any evidence to prove that they were transmission limited. They never testified under oath in any proceeding regarding this project in Massachusetts or in Maine. And it, it, the other reason that hydropower projects spill is because building storage is expensive. So there's a limit to how tall you can make your dam and how wide you can make your dam and still have it make economic sense, right? So you can't store all the water in the world because then your right. dam is as big hey, as Hey, Rob, I've world. got another, another commitment. I got to go. It's after one. Yeah, no. No worries. I am going to wrap this up here real quick. And Mac, if you need if you need to jump off right here, but I do need to let people know the answer to quiz question number three, because it wasn't covered in the topics, is the Androscoggin River. That's all you need to know. If you're listening, quiz question number three, answer the Androscoggin River. Um, so yeah, it looks like we did lose Mac, but I am going to wrap this up. And uh, Nick and, and uh, Alan's still with us. Like, it sounds like we could do a whole show about the corridor, but the reason, and you make a good point, Nick, I did bring it up, but I did because it has a, a huge impact on our rivers and our waterways and our environment. And, you know, and it, and it impacts everything we do. I mean, I drive by the Pachepska Dam in Brunswick every day. And, you know, I know there's a small amount of power generation happening there. And, and, uh, but I also know that it has an effect on, on our treatment outfall and, and how our permit is because where, where the Brunswick sewer district is on the Androscoggin River is actually tidal. So there are parts of the day where there, where there's essentially no water movement at all. So our dilution factor is uh, very low and, and it makes treatment a challenge. Um, and, and that's, you know, the dam clearly has an effect on that. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it or, or in favor of it. I'm just saying it, it, it's something that we deal with. But what um, do you see? I'll just, I'll just ask you this quickly. What do you see at the Pajepska Dam in March? In March, a lot of water. <laughs> right. You see a lot of water going over that dam. That's because that's all hydropower water. dams spill. Right. You see a lot of water today going over it because it was a very, very wet uh, January and, and the river was backed up pretty much the whole month. So it was um, a you very know, wet January. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I do need to thank our sponsors again. Uh, Carlson Systems, as I said, uh, without their support, we couldn't have this show. Uh, Brian's always stepped to the plate when, when I need him. Um, and and he, he's a big supporter of the podcast. And, you know, for 11 years, they've represented leading manufacturers such as Salzer, Grunfos, GA Industries, and USEMCO. And of course, they recently purchased David F. Sullivan and Associates and, uh, and expanded their product line to include Evoqua, West Tech, Duperon, BDP Industries, and more. And, uh, and again, thank you. And of course, EJ Prescott, uh, you know, they, they support everything that Maine Water Utilities and Mawea are involved in. Um, and it wouldn't happen, this show wouldn't happen without their support. So again, they're not just a vendor, they're a partner in our industry. And I truly appreciate everything they've done for us. And uh, their mission is to subscribe to sound operating practices that re will result in safe working conditions and efficiency of operations. And I would say that they have clearly met their mission and I know they will continue to meet it for many years to come. Um, so I do have, honestly, this is great. Uh, another, another great round. I was a little 
nervous about how this first uh, follow-up show would go. And uh, we got some great banter and, and some great stories. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and we still only covered about half of the topics that I had written down. So we may consider a third one if, if our guests would be so kind. But, um, but I do want to thank him. And I want to turn it over to, uh, to Nick. If you've got a, a minute or two, you want to get some final thoughts in? Uh, no, I would be really happy to do another show. I, I like talking with Alan and you and Mac, and I'm happy to do that anytime. All right. Well, and I appreciate it. You've been you've been a fantastic guest, and and you provide a great uh, opinion with a, with a lot of facts behind it. And and uh, you know, it's been great to have you on the show. And so, Alan, what about you? Anything you want to say to the audience before we wrap it up? Well, I guess, uh, you know, one thing I thought you would, had talked to us before about <clears throat> trying to make everything relevant to water. And, you know, as I thought it over, I, I, I was pressed to find any ecological issue today that doesn't in the end relate to water in some way, some fashion. I mean, every time you read about it, whether it has to do with nuclear power plants or whether it has to, whatever the issue, it always somewhere clean water is a factor of it. I guess I'd never thought about that until I thought in the terms of trying to figure out how it was that what we would talk about would be related to clean water. Right. Yeah. And it turns out everything is really, I mean, yeah. and well, that's, that's what we say. I think it's WEF or I can't remember which organization's motto is, but essentially water is life, you know, and besides air, uh, the next thing is, is water. And, um, and we're, we're fortunate where we live in Maine. We have a lot of good clean water and we have some great people in this industry, um, whether you're, you're like myself and, and work for a, a sewer district or, or Mac or Alan working on the river or Nick working, you know, to protect the rivers from a, from a different side of, of, of where we are on the, on the uh, sewer treatment side. You know, um, everybody's working together with the same goal in the end. You know, we want clean, clean, reliable drinking water and, and we want clean uh, recreational waterways and uh, and we want good aquatic life. So, um, well, I'll wrap it up. I've rambled on enough myself. So uh, thanks again uh, for coming on and thanks for everyone listening. We had some good chats and, and I got a lot of good feedback. The stories were great and well appreciated. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be in touch uh, again for another episode soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.